Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Oh, what a cracker we've got for you today. The Legendino is in Rio with a, a very sexy voice you've got <laughs> there, Tim. Works for radio. Does it work yeah. for a podcast, I wonder? Yeah, well, Rio is my first, my last, and and my everything. <laughs> That's the one I was thinking of, actually. Yeah. So I'm glad it was your first, your last, <laughs> and your everything. Anyway, we are talking today about a cracker of a game, and a cracker in all sorts of ways. We'll explain. Do you know, do you know he did that. a song? Do you know Barry White did a song? Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> no, he didn't. He, 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 he did. did. <laughs> Look it up. Look it up. I'll be releasing well, my own cover version before before uh, nightfall. Yeah. Somehow they didn't play that in the clubs that I went to, but yeah. Um, I'm sure it was huge in Rio like it was everywhere well, It's huge else. in most places, isn't it, really? <laughs> Tim, you're on form today, despite the voice. Anyway, let's introduce everybody to our guests uh, this uh, time around. It's Christopher James Evans, journalist, writer, got a new book out called Los Leones, and it is about a unique club in Spain, in La Liga, but also, arguably, we're going to look today at a quite unique match, aren't we? Chris, good uh, afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's uh, it's an honour to be on with such uh, two legends of the uh, uh, of the broadcasting world. So thanks, oh, for, only, thanks for having me on. Sorry, there's only one legend here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. uh, so yeah. you can work out which one it is. By the way, <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> what what a book though, Los Leones, the unique story of Athletic Club Bilbao, which for those who know their Spanish football will know is the Basque country's finest. Uh, never been relegated amongst other things, but also staunch, proud, political and culturally significant. And leads us to an obvious question. Chris, do you think that being Welsh gives you some kind of connection, that kind of regional identity within the bigger? Does that mean there was an instant connection between you and Athletic? Um, I think so. Some people might dispute that, but certainly my interest in um, sort of athletic club and, and, and the Basque country is is to do with being Welsh and being from a, a sort of, you know, a small nation that's historically been repressed. Um, lots of historical ties, you know, so during the Industrial Revolution, lots of uh, Welsh people went over to work in the Basque country and, and vice versa. And also during the Spanish Civil War, 200 Welsh miners joined the international brigades to fight against fascism fight, uh, fight against franco um 35 of them actually died uh, dur during that struggle so there's lots of his historical ties with the basque country and um that's certainly what um you know my interest came from but also the fact that i i come from a small village called kylian just outside of newport in south wales and we housed 57 basque refugees during the civil war and and they they actually formed an amazing football team that became known as the Basque Wonder Boys and beat everybody around Wales, which is not surprising really with us with our football history, is it? But um, they 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 apparently they were amazing at football, and that story is is also added to everything. All these links and ties, and uh, that drew me to Athletic and and, and and you know my interest in them and and the Basque Country. I've never been to Bilbao, which which I regret, but I have been to Donostia. All oh, right, okay. The, the rivals yeah. that is Tim. Yeah. In, indeed, <laughs> Other, otherwise known as San Sebastian, which uh, if if it's in the the twentieth century, you got to do it in a Richie Benno accent. Nineteen ninety one, uh, and I had a I had a ball with a few mates there. Um, but the thing that really struck me was just the force of of the the, the regional identity. You know, big banners. This is not Spain. Yeah. Uh, huge, <laughs> huge banners and everything in a in a in a in a second language. And I remember we had a we had an epic drunken night and ended up putting money in the collection, which I think was for Etta, you know. And as a result of that, we were like welcomed and taken to some clandestine disco where it was brilliant. It's a fabulous, fabulous night. But their team is called Royal Society. Yes. Real Sociedad, uh, and so this this struck me as being somewhat incongruous. You know, this is uh, royal. Athletic is obviously more radical, isn't it? Bill Bow is much more radical in this. Yeah, I think so. I think um, although historically Athletic have got ties with the PMV, which is the sort of it's the Basque Nationalist Party, but they're sort of centre right. 
but yeah, I think um, there is a big, you know, like, as you mentioned, Royal Sociedad means Royal Society. There, there's a big um, difference in background. But now I think it's just the name is stuck with uh, Royal Sociedad because they got a lot of um, sort of anti-Royal, anti-Spain. You know, they are almost as, as Basque as Athletic the Club. I can't say they are as Basque as Athletic the Club because I'll be lynched. But um, they, 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 you know, the, the Basque derby, the both clubs, they've got a rivalry, but it's a unique rivalry because although... You know, inevitably they hate each other. It's it's almost like a brotherly rivalry where they love each other but hate each other at the same time. So if you go to a Basque derby, there's no, you know, all the fans are mixing in the streets beforehand. They they mix in the stands. I don't know if you've seen the the famous um, incident a few months back. Uh, there's an athletic fan facing uh, the camera with a big smile on his face, and Real Sociedad are winning. And they're all doing the what's it called the Poznan behind them, bouncing all the Real Sociedad's feet, and, and he's just there like that grinning. And it's just, I think that encapsulates the sort of relationship between the clubs because they do get on. It's, it's a u- sort of unique um, uh, rivalry. Um, but yeah, they, they they do also hate each other as well. But ultimately, they're fighting for the same cause. And that same cause is being Basque, as you said, not being Spanish. Because, um, you know, don't call them Spanish because you, you'll, you'll get it. Uh, you might get chinned. Yeah, now that you've <laughs> answered Tim's Patagonia question... Uh, Bilbao is unique, as I remember, as a football club, that they only recruit from within the Basque region. However, I'm told that of late, the sense of within the Basque region has stretched to its extremities. Um, yeah, so the Basque only policy is it's a, it's an interesting one, and you you could debate it all day. So. What 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 I think is really interesting is that that policy actually comes from the fact that um, in 1911, I think it was, they played Real Sociedad, ironically, in the 1911 Copa del, de la Coronación, which is the Copa del Rey. And Real Sociedad accused Athletic of fielding ineligible foreign players or ineligible players earlier on in the tournament. And because Athletic, they just basically cut their nose off despite their face and were like, well, up yours, we're never going to play with anybody other than people from the Basque country from now on. And that's where it came from. So it actually came by proxy from Real Sociedad complaining about them. But yes, the, the Basque only philosophy thing is, is a contentious issue because some people see it as being, I suppose, xenophobic or and a bit too na- nationalistic. But then the athletic and um, athletic fans, they see it as being, they're just being proud of their, their nation. And it's part of their identity that to show that their Basqueness um, and their philosophy is, they, they, you know, it does make this sort of bond between the fans and the city and Biscaya and Bilbao. Obviously, it, it, there's something there. I, I can't explain it. When you go to Bilbao, it's everywhere. There's not many one club cities in the world I can think of. So, you know, you live in Rio, Tim, lots of clubs. I, I, I went to Buenos Aires. There's lots of big clubs. You go to Bilbao and it's just athletic. It's literally, it's, it's, it's a fascinating policy. But they have bent the rules in the past, no doubt. Uh, you know, Laporte... John Aldridge? Played... Sorry? John, John Aldridge? Al... So Real, John Aldridge Royal played... Society. Yes, he played for Real Sociedad. Oh, he was their first athlete. official foreign yeah. foreign signing. Uh, and actually, he played for Newport County, my local club as well. So um, that's, that's a nice little tie the, as well. That was my Patagonian tie <laughs> question. But anyway, yes. Uh, um, yeah, well, you said that they bent all that. They bent the the definition a bit. Well, it, it's it's not written anywhere that it's not, it's not in, you know, it's just something they do. But there are players who might um, like, so Laporte was French and they, they athletic moved yeah, into but, the Basque region. Yeah, yeah but France would, has some of the Basque regions, yes. doesn't it? Liz yes, Azou, for example, is exactly. This, yeah, but he wasn't really... actually, he was brought to the French Basque region. We brought up there. So he was formed in the Basque country. So there's all these. How, little, how do how do we define this? I mean, on, on Spain is is riven by mountain ranges and very regional. Um, but how do we find define in a in a in a in a in a kind of modern globalized society full of transhumans? How do we f- define what is a Basque and who is a Basque? So that's a good question. It's probably not one I can answer. Probably Tim, but yeah. The, so the, their policy is that to play for Athletic, you have to have been born in the Basque country, as in. The Basque country, which is in northern Spain, I suppose you would say. I wouldn't say that. The Basque region and in southern Fr- and part of southern France. And you can play for Athletic. Um, there are there are arguments going on that they think 
the Basque diaspora should be allowed to play for Athletic as well, because you know, the, you know, there's a there are children of Basque people living in the rest of Spain, in South America, Mexico. You know, there's a huge diaspora in South America. So uh, I interviewed Andy, Anthony Goicochea uh, for the book, and he thinks that Athletic, you know, to carry on progressing, um, should allow the Basque diaspora to um, play for Athletic. But if all the fans I've spoken to, certainly in Bilbao, they don't agree with that. They just want to keep it things they- as they are. Would they agree with Antoine Griezmann being of Basque origin, just in case he needs to leave Atletico Madrid anytime soon and he doesn't want to go as far north as France? Well, I'm sure they'd like him to play for an athletic club, but he doesn't qualify from what from, from what did he not grow up is. there? Did he not grow up? No, no. So there's a, there's a reason why he did. I don't. There's a reason why he didn't. I can't think off the top of my head, but there's a reason that he doesn't qualify. I don't think to play for Athletic. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a very um, it's a contentious issue, you know, and uh, it's, it's 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 one that makes them so fascinating as a club, I suppose. So, uh, someone born in the Basque region, of non-Basque parents and of non-Basque lineage, yes. still counts. Yes, so it's so, inclusive. It's inclusive in that sense. Yes, and and, and I think they are modernising with in that sense. So you think of Inaki and Nico Williams, um, two of their brilliant players. Um, their parents are actually they they fled uh, Ghana, and actually the story of that is unbelievable because their their mum was pregnant with Inyaki at the time she didn't realise, and they crossed the Sahara barefoot, climbed into the Spanish territory in northern Africa in Melilla, um, and eventually ended up in Bilbao, and that is how Inyaki qualifies to play because he was born in Bilbao. Um, so there is that modernisation of things where. And, and that's going to become more common because, there are, you know, migration is happening all the time, which I only think is a positive thing. And I think most people who play for Athletic, you know, the Williams brothers are the heroes at the moment. And I, I really hope we see more players um, from different backgrounds playing for Athletic. And I think it will happen. I, I really think Inyaki Williams has been a, a sort of pioneer. He speaks so well as well. And I think it's, um, it's something we'll see more of. Yeah, whatever people think of uh, the policy the Basque only policy it's a well-run club from what I understand how has it managed to be you know given its restrictions on recruitment how has it managed to never be relegated from the top flight that's a good question it's, it's crazy when you think about along with Barcelona and Real Madrid you know the heavyweights uh, in Spain that they've never been relegated from from what I think I think that it is a hindrance, obviously, that they can't go and buy Lionel Messi or whatever. But I think it gives them this uniqueness. This is the word that you always crops up with us at the club, that the players want to play for them if they're close to relegation. Instead of thinking, oh, I can go and join another club now. I don't... They actually care for their club. They love their club. And, and it, it, this, this bond with the fans, this, the 12th man, as they call it, you know. Um, and I think it's a positive thing. And I think the philosophy is actually a reason why they haven't been uh, relegated, as, as opposed to why... Why, why have they been relegated? Maybe if they didn't have the philosophy, they would have been relegated. But um, yeah, it, it causes this unique bond and this uh, this uh, between the fans and and the players playing for the... They, they actually care and they really care about Athletic. They're passionate about them. Does everything that happens around the club, does it all happen in the Basque language? Well, the Basque language is certainly having um, a boost recently. And actually, when they won the Copa del Rey recently... A player called Villaribre spoke on the balcony and he, he said, I, I'm, I want, he said, I'm speaking to the youth. A pillar of athletic is the Basque language. And he said, I'm, I'm urging you to speak it more often because obviously Spanish is the national official language. But Euskera, as it's called, is the Basque language and it's an unbelievable language. It's amazing when you go there, you know, seeing these TXs everywhere and it's just a fascinating language. But it's part of athletic, definitely. And they've got their own um, Basque Twitter account in the Basque language and you go to the Basque country and it is everywhere and they are speaking it more, particularly the the, the youngsters and and hopefully there's a bigger push. A bit like Welsh, we, we, we were sort of, um you know, repressed from speaking it. That's why I'm a, I'm South Walian. I don't really speak much Welsh because we were stopped from doing it. But now some, some in South Wales never spoke Welsh. No, no, but that that is because we were told not to. You know, the, have you heard of the Welsh not? We were being, we were told not to speak Welsh historically and the Basque, same as the Basque, when Franco was in power, he completely outlawed uh, the Basque language, so they could not speak it. Uh, you could be thrown in prison or worse for speaking a language. Uh, it's crazy when you think about it. 
Mate, um, there, there, there was an expression in uh, in 1970s Spain for when the, the the flaming heat of July or August. It's hotter than Franco's ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, that's a good Tim, saying. Tim, you, you interrupted me to say that. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. I thought it was worthwhile at the time. Well, yeah, at the time it probably was. But as we've moved on from there, but you say this is not Spain, and yet Bilbao play in the Spanish La Liga, and the game that we're going to talk about is the Spanish FA Cup, the Copa del Rey. What's not Spanish about... <laughs> <laughs> this Basque or Bilbao? Well, I'm not answering that one. I, they're, they're, they're not. They're not Spanish. Is that well? You could uh, you could argue the same thing. Why a Cardiff City and Swansea well, City no, in in, but, in the English National League? You know, I, I was going to say the better comparison is you know why is Australia in the Eurovision Song Contest? I right. would argue you know it would be the word anyway. But apart from yeah. that, Copa del Rey 1984 is what we're talking about, isn't it? Um, now that they were they were a very strong time at the, a team at the time, weren't they? Yeah, huge. Um, I remember them. I remember. And them. and that the coach Javier Clement, who took Spain, I think, to the the World Cup in nineteen ninety eight. He's he's a hard dude, and he's produced a hard hard team. Is that part of the historical identity of how Athletic play? Definitely, and and as you mentioned about Clemente, he is a he what a character. I interviewed him for the book actually, and I was I was more nervous than I am was coming on to speak to you two. To be honest, um, he's a formidable character, but he's a huge like Athletic Club founded by British migrants and Basque students. He's a huge Anglophile, uh, Javier Clemente, and spent time with Bobby Robson when he was at Ipswich, that famous you know sort of defensive team but successful team. And he picked up all his sort of um, football news and tactics from Bobby Robson. And he sees him as one of his heroes. And that sort of, yeah, English style of football, I would say old school style of football, you know, sort of route one, take no prisoners. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, then take no, but you know, you get the route. And then um, <laughs> let rip some, let rip. <laughs> no, no, my mum might tell me off. Um, so, uh, so, so route one football, tough tackling. Based on, a, you know, having a strong keeper in Zubi Zareta, you know, went on to play for Barcelona. You know, formidable defence with, in the centre, you've got uh, Anthony Goikache, known as the butcher of Bilbao, which he doesn't like, but, you know. You interviewed was. him as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, go on, go on. Sorry. You came out of that in one piece, which is good to I know. <laughs> Just about. No, so actually, yeah, it was it was one of those. And, and I, he did the forward for my book as well. And um, not to blow smoke up your ass, Tim, but I got the idea from... Oh, easy on I the read... ass. You'd never yeah. be listening. <laughs> so I read the book. I read the book Tears at La Bombonera by Christopher Hillen, and you had written the foreword, Tim. And when Goyke I interviewed Goyke, when I interviewed Goyke Chair, I thought, oh, why don't I ask him if he'll write the foreword for me? And he did. So that's where the idea came from, Tim. That's the truth, by the way. So you couldn't afford Tim Vickery, mate. Mate, <laughs> mate. <laughs> well, that's, he's South American football, isn't he? You know? This uh, is yeah, true. Yeah. This is true. So anyway, uh, yeah. So Clemente was, a, was, a, was an amazing, formidable manager, and that was reflected in his team. So we're talking about uh, the Copa del Rey on the 5th of May, 1984. You talk about Bill Bauer being a team of hard men, Tim. Um, they seem to get harder when a certain Diego Maradona is uh, in the opposite. It, the it, opposite. it is. It, it's, it's, oh, I would recommend anyone look at the, the YouTube highlights of this. This is the showpiece final. Okay. And the treatment that, that, that Maradona gets in this game. And you, you wonder how he could walk afterwards. And uh, he took it as well. I remember yeah, you telling did, yeah. us this. You've you've told me several times, uh, in defence of uh, Maradona, but in defence of strikers as well uh, or midfielders, that they had no protection from the None. referees in those days. So you've got the best footballer on the pitch, arguably. I don't want to ruffle any uh, Basque <laughs> feathers, but uh, no, he was the best player on the pitch. Is still arguably the best player ever in the world and he he is being literally hacked down there's mm. another word for no, it but people just and going through the back of him every, yeah, every time two or three 
because they they know who the best player is. So they've yeah. got two or three men on him. He hardly touches the ball without getting hacked down. You're yeah. right. It is a good highlight to watch because it you is. Do yeah. And he, he he never hides. He never, never hides. Never he, hides. He, he saves his aggro till afterwards. We'll come to that. Um, because on the pitch, I'm thinking, how how is he not whacking them yeah. back for that? You yeah. know, because nowadays, at least you do see one of those head to head things. You know the um, not a head, but literally, but you know, one bull's forehead with another bull's forehead. But you see that only once. Um, so I thought he managed to maintain his, and certainly in one occasion when I think he should have got a penalty in any case in this, I know we're jumping ahead, in one occasion where he should have got a penalty on this and the Bilbao defenders come up and acts like, you know, you're just flipping play acting. Mm. Uh, they really want to try and get him sent off because they're winding mm. him up. A second defender comes up mm. and says, yeah, you are play acting. They're just waiting for him to nut them, but he doesn't do it. Yeah, I mean, Chris, he, this is... Uh, I don't know how old you are, but this is before your time, isn't it? Um, is only it? just. I'm, I'm nearly 42. So, it, Oh, no, sorry. Well, I was alive. Sorry, 84. Yeah, so I was two. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. easy so, to forget. Yeah, well, that's what's There's happening now as I got older. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but th this is the kind of football that was... It, it, it wasn't uncommon when me and Dotton were growing up. What's it like for you watching the brutality he, uh, heaped on Maradona during this game? Well... Do you know, I think I'm quite aware of it because, um, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s, Maradona was one of my idols growing up. And you just have to watch the height, the footage of him on YouTube in, in the Italian league as well. As you just mentioned, he just gets lumps kicked out of him. He, you know, he would have been protected the day, but he, just, he gets on with it. It's unbelievable. And mm. um, I, I just think that's why I think he's the best player of all time. I just think, you know, mm. Ronaldo and Messi are amazing. But would, would they have been able to put up with the challenges of Maradona, and he rode those challenges as well. He did. How, how he managed to do it is it unbelievable. Well, I mean, what a player. What, did, what, and that's... He, 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 I think maybe once, possibly he dived, possibly, uh, but once, all the other times he's getting hacked down and still trying to stay on his feet, Yeah, which, you know, you wouldn't see that today. And he always wants the ball. If you're lucky, he always yeah, wants the ball. Yeah. And, and and the reason why they you, you see Athletic trying to kick lumps in, into him is because Clemente knew if they let him play, they're going to lose. If Maradona plays and plays, they're going to lose. And so the, the way to, to stop that was kicking lumps into him, basically. As yeah. I, I imagine you have a, a strong affinity. You're almost like a, a supporter of this club. As you watch these highlights, do you think that this this stains the triumph? Um, I'm not going to watch what I say. Um, no, no, I don't think so. I think I just think uh, that that's to be expected. Maybe that's, if I was around at the time, we, I would have thought it. But you look back in history, and I, I think that's Clemente's style of play. And you know, Maradona had broken his ankle a, a year earlier, mm. um, and I think he was, you know, he was coming back. He wanted to put that right by winning and winning the cup. And he scored two goals against Athletic actually a few months before the cup final in, in one of his return matches, and just destroyed Athletic. And he was due to miss the. He should have missed the final because he'd been booked the week before. But the Spanish FA actually. Were a bit lenient and give him a one match ban instead of a two match ban. So he played in the final, and I think that sort of um, ruffled the feathers of Clemente, and probably added to the why they were trying to just basically take him out of the game. Let's, you know, let's be honest. It's, you you look at the highlights. It's um, it's ruthless, isn't it? Yeah, an added backstory to this is the guy that nearly ended his career a year before, like you said, when he broke his leg, is on the pitch against him now. Yeah, Goikachea, yeah. So he's known as, you know, internationally as the butcher of Bilbao. But in Bilbao, he he hates that name because he was a brilliant player. There's no, you know, he was a brilliant player. Um, but obviously he's remembered as one of these hard men. And obviously for breaking um, Maradona's ankle. And, and when I asked him the question, which I had to ask him, obviously, yeah, yeah. you could just see he's like, oh, for God's sake, I've been asked this a million times, you know, and he, he made a point of saying, I've scored these, this amount of goals, I've won these trophies, and I'm still mm -hmm. remembered outside of Bilbao as the butcher. Yeah. But actually in Bilbao, he's known as uh, the, uh, the Lionheart. And uh, so, but yeah, he, he was, you know, he, he's also injured Schuster, you know, the who played for Barcelona, the amazing German player. Um, a year previously to breaking Maradona's ankle. You, you, you see these hills. You see these hills. I build these hills with my bare hands. But do they call me Juan the Builder of Hills? No. 
None call me that. You see this bridge? I build this bridge with my bare hands. But do they call me Juan the Builder of Bridges? No, never. But you fuck one donkey. <laughs> <laughs> I should have told him that story, Tim. <laughs> it's Terry Butcher that I feel sorry for. Yeah, like, what's he done to deserve an exit like that? <laughs> I'm glad that glad that tickled you. Uh, anyway, yes, it did actually. Yeah, I'm on, really... on with the game. The, 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 the standout, obviously, Zubi Zareta stands out. And Goiko Chia stands out of the from the lineup, but the one who also stands out for me, as someone who's kind of collecting World Cup sticker cards, is uh, Danny, Danny okay. Ruiz Bazan. Is he the star attacking talent of, of of this team? Yeah, and 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 the captain as well. And and Danny was a bit of a goal machine, really. And um, didn't get on the score sheet in this game, obviously, but he was the you know the the star player. Um, but yeah, and what, and what a player as well Danny was. As um, but yeah, I think that you look at that athletic team. There are actually a lot of you know Barcelona were, were a formidable team and always are. But that athletic team is full of great players, as you mentioned, Danny and Goicochea and Zubi Zareta. They got they've got strength throughout the throughout the team really. Yeah, uh, Tim's given away the ending. Um, shame on you, Tim. Not with the accent, mm -hmm. but you gave away the ending earlier on. So well, we know that uh, Bilbao win this. How much did it mean? Um, well, I can understand what it means for them, but how much did it mean for Barcelona not to win it? Because this ends in a brawl, this match. As, you know, great. It was a bit of a scrappy goal. Would you agree? And um, th there might have been other goals in it, but it was like a bit of a scrap fest in 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 the penalty areas, um, certainly in the Bilbao penalty area. But tell me, how much did it mean to Barcelona not to win this? How big a loss was it for them? Well, I think if you, I think Barcelona expected to win, as probably everybody else did, you know. Um, but when Athletic scored, I think it was in the fourteenth minute, and Dika scored. Um, that suited Clemente's style of play. You know, there are some clubs where they score when the first goal and you think, oh, God, this is going to finish 1-0. And I think there was a, an air of inev inevitability about once if Athletic scores first, that would be it. So Barcelona were obviously extremely frustrated. You've got Schuster and Maradona, who had been on the end of Goicochea's um, roughness, shall I say, in previous years. I'm sure they wanted to get revenge. It didn't happen. And then that frustration obviously boils over into what, what, what we're going to talk about, I assume. It does bring an era to an end for Barcelona. And their coach is Cesar Luis Minotti, who won the Argent the, the World Cup with Argentina in 78. It took a lot out of him, you know, that those four... He, 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 he released a book about how he won the World Cup. And he makes the point. He has a photo of himself when he took the job in 74 and a photo of, of himself after winning in 78. And he's aged 20 years yeah. in those four. Smoking 70 a day probably yeah. didn't help. Ooh, <laughs> but ooh. it's also the the, the pressure of, of, of that, that position. And I think he was a little bit of a spent force afterwards. I, I don't think he was, he was quite on his game. And after this, he goes. And in comes Terry Venables. And that, 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 that's, that, that's a big change. And that's some of... Because English clubs were bossing Europe at this point. And that Venables brought some of some of that in, you know, with with a higher line. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it, it's you wonder had Barcelona won this game, maybe there wouldn't have been a change of coach. Maybe maybe the, the whole history of of because a lot of a lot of what Saki did with with Milan, Venables had done already with, with with Barcelona, and you just wonder had they won this game, maybe that 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 uh, that story would have been different. Venables wouldn't have got the job. That's interesting. I've never, really, I've never really thought of that. That's a great point, isn't it? And um, it's funny how these sliding doors moments happen, isn't it? Yeah. And um, yeah, really, that's mad. And but Venables, you know, he he did quite well at Barcelona, didn't he? So, um, but yeah, um, Menotti is a fascinating one because, as you mentioned, he spoke seventy a day or whatever. Is it is his nickname El Flaco or something like that? Yeah, uh, it's the, the, the thin, thin one, the thin man. Thin one, the thin yeah, one. and yeah. Um, but he, you know, he was sort of a, a left leaning, chilled out, bit of a cool dude. And that's why he clashed so much with Javier Clemente, who was the polar opposite to him in style of yeah. football and politics and everything else. So that added to all this and probably played a part in what happened after the game, you know, because they were 
words before and after the game, which um, yeah. yeah, quite funny it, to it, read them now. It's a clash of ideologies, isn't it? Yes, it's a clash yes. of of how you play football and how you live how you live your life. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, it's a that, clash that's... of hard men as well. At the end, I don't know how it kicks off. It's not clear from the highlights. Well, it, you can feel the tension brewing through a lot of the match, can't you? You can feel it coming, but I don't think you're expecting that. Um, what well, brutal brawl? I think if you if you watch the highlights, um, you know, I spoke to a few people about the match. I spoke to Gokachea about what happened and and Endika, the goal scorer. And by all accounts, there was um one of the athletic players called Sola, Miguel Angel Sola, I think it is. He sort of goaded Maradona at the end. And, you know, as he ran on the pitch when Athletic went sort of and then well, if you did, um Maradona is a tough nut, grew up in a, you know, is, tough shanty town. He is and, a tough nut. He learned a bit from Bruce Lee growing yeah, up yeah. in that shanty mm-hmm. town and all. So he gives him a bit of a push. And as, as Sol is getting back up, I mean, if you watch it, it's pretty brutal if you look on YouTube. Mm. And Maradona just gets him, knocks him out cold, uh, knocks him out cold with his knee. And uh, and then obviously everybody else is joining in. Inevitably, Goyka Che is there. And he, he actually puts a gash into Maradona's leg. And af- after the game, Maradona is saying... You know, look what he's done to me. And and Goyka Chea, Riley said uh, he'd made them with scissors, you know, um, <laughs> saying that Maradona's lying. So it's, 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 it's chaotic, but the scenes are mad. I'm, I'm sure you've watched on YouTube. It's Indeed. chaos. Quite a lot of football brawls are quite pathetic, aren't they? Uh, it's kind of, you know, hold me back, hold well, me back. You know, nothing really happens. This is the real deal. This is full on. Do you know what struck me about this was that the ones that usually start it are the ones who usually run away when all the other players get involved, you know, <laughs> they stay away like, you know, yeah. what's going on? But Maradona keeps, yeah. he has opportunities to slide yeah. away and sneak away, but he keeps going back into the thick of it. He's not having it, you know, nobody's holding him back on this one. No, and he's got um, a ripped shirt. Have you seen his ripped shirt as well? You know, he looks like he's, you know, and he's still going for it, right? Into the, he had to be escorted off at the end because he's... um. You know, he's what, tough what nut. Was the, what was the consequence of that? He well, he actually left Bar- Barcelona, got rid of him after that match because not just that incident, obviously, has played a huge part. But I think everything that went with Maradona's private life is starting to take its toll, and so Barcelona well, he, got rid to Napoli. He owed, he owed a fortune, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. So but it, he he needed he needed the move to move to Napoli. Yeah. yeah. So how, um, yeah. how did he end up owing a fortune? Wasn't he because his his entire entourage. Yeah. Came over to to Barcelona and they were running up running up debts all over the place, so you know Venables would have loved to keep him, uh, and uh, it's it's the thing that Venables got the vibe that he got from the other players. Maradona isn't a fancy day; he's Ooh. not doing tricks for the crowd forty yards from goal. Maradona is a giver, you know. Mm, yeah. So who doesn't want to work with him? You know, you got the, the the best player in the world, and all he wants is for the team to win. Obviously, you want to work with him, but financially. Maradona need, needed the move. Was this the best Maradona then, Tim? Was he better at this period in Barcelona? No, I think, you, I think you're, just, you're just going to come into that now. Because uh, yeah. uh, the, 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 the Napoli stuff is it, it's practically unrivaled, isn't it? You know, to take somewhere, someone like Napoli and, and make them the, 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 the power in the land. Uh, I think so. I think that that's absolute peak Maradona. But I'm sure all the buffeting that he took... Uh, from the likes of Goykachia has hardened him up and, and toughened him up. Although I think it's also part of the tragedy because some of the drugs that he gets into is just painkillers mm. to get out there and play because, you know, w- you look at what they're doing to him in this game. And obviously that has consequences, has consequences on his ankle and as, as, as because people are just going, you, you end up watching this thinking he needed shin pads in the back. Yeah. He needed Not just the front. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were there consequences from the Spanish uh, FA as well? Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember, but there were certainly bans and huge fines for both clubs. Um, and, you know, let's be honest, we're talking about the match, but we're not, are we? We're talking about the brawl. And I think that's what, speaking to athletic uh, players, they're a bit, um, you know, they sort of lament that the match is remembered for the brawl, not the fact that they just won the double, you know, they just won oh. La Liga and the cup double, but it's overshadowed with, with the, the fight. What, what have they ever done in, in Europe? Because I would imagine that this should be really important to them because yes. then they're, they're taking the flag of the Basque, the Basque country around the continents. 
So what what have they ever done in in the European competitions? Well, they've they they've done all right historically, and in in the sixties and seventies they got to some quarterfinals and stuff. And get qualifying for Europe is for athletic is all it's saying dramatic saying it's almost like winning the league, but it almost is because getting to Europe, as you say, taking the bus flag around Europe is something they want to do. They want to promote their club and their 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 nation, their language, everything. Um, so getting to Europe is really important, and that's why they look back at things like um the Marcelo Bielsa side of 2012 when he managed Athletic and they mm-hmm. completely destroyed Manchester United in the Europa League. Um, that is is one of the most important games in their history. And because it's in Europe, because it's against such a historic club as Manchester United. So it is important to them. And it does actually look like they're going to qualify this year for the Europa League, at least potentially the Champions League for the first time in, in, in a long time. But yeah, it's really important to them, Tim, definitely. What about during during the Clemente years? When they're oh, they winning ne- they, trophies. All oh, right, yeah, they 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 didn't get uh, they didn't get too far. I can't remember what round right now, but yeah, not you know they've never you know, they've never won um, a big European competition, but um, yeah, that's the uh, maybe. And, that's and, the, and perhaps they're not as strong a club in La Liga now as they were at this point, or are they? No, no, no. Well, they they in they won the league in eighty three La Liga. They won La Liga and Copa del Rey in eighty three eighty four. So obviously that's unique, but the globalization of football really yeah. uh, killed Athletic. Um, so it's, it's harder for them to compete now, isn't it? Of course, right. yeah, of course, and um, it, it is harder for them. But you know, this this year they've won the Copa del Rey. They're they're fourth in the league, and they they or fifth in the league at the moment, but potentially going to be fourth. And that that's um, that's unbelievable. And I think that's largely down to the, that uniqueness of their philosophy, but also their manager Valverde is fantastic, a hugely mm-hmm. underrated manager. Do you ever go well, out there? Do you, do you yeah, go out I've there been, and watch them? Yeah, I've been out five, five times. I went out to watch the celebration. So when they win a trophy, they have something called the Lagavara, which is the, the boat that goes down the river in Bilbao. It's a really unique celebration. And they did it in 84. And it was a million people on the on the streets of Bilbao. And it became sort of this mythology. Um, and it, it became, you know, they became the laughing stock really with other clubs. Winding them up, oh, when are you going to bring your boat out? You know, because they didn't win anything for 40 years until just gone, the couple of just gone. So... I went out with my family. I took my wife and my boys out, and we went to the celebrations um, to see this Lagabara, this boat going down. And it was it was chaos, millions of people on the streets, and it was an uh, unbelievable experience. But yeah, and I've been I go to watch them every, you know, I've, I've been to watch them three times in the last two years. So um, it's, it's a great experience. And if you can get back over at any point, I know you've been to Donostia. Mm-hmm. If you could beat the Bilbao, Bilbao is a great city too, and they're only an yeah, hour away from each other. And, and what language see. what language do you speak when you when you're out there? English. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it wasn't a wind up. For no, once, no. it wasn't a wind up. No, I, um, I could speak Spanish to an okay level, you know, like a, but, an okay level. But, but I, how but... does that go down, though? You speak in Spanish in the Basque country. So, no, everyone speaks Spanish. Everyone can speak Spanish. But if and you they'd rather know, not. Um, probably rather not. I think. I think what what I find when I go to the Basque country is. Bilbao is obviously a city, so it's multicultural and Spanish is probably the main language. You go out to little villages like Guernica, you know, the famous place where the bombings happened mm. and they become even more Basque, if you could say that. They yeah. sp- they speak Basque is their language. Um, they've got stronger views on Basque nationalism. So there is that. But yeah, it everyone really speaks... is Wales. It really is Wales <laughs> through and through. Yeah, da uh, Bilbao. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't do that. that. Let's send them one of our princes. I think we've got enough of them. Right. So... I don't want any... We don't want any of your princes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean we? You've already got one. <laughs> I don't know. Well, be forced on us. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going Good point. There. Good point. Well made. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But you, you, when you get to the north of Wales, you certainly start getting into the you know more sort of radical <laughs> Welsh people, I think, which is good. I, I love it. You know, I, I haven't got a problem with it at all. Long may it continue. Now, having said that, if we're making the comparison between uh, the Basque Country and Wales, which is the Bilbao of Wales, athletic Bilbao of Wales, and why haven't any of the Welsh equivalents achieved the kind of success do you think that Bilbao has achieved? Oh, that's a t- um, we're not good as fo- we're not as good at football as the Basques, obviously. Um, well, I'm no, not I, sure about that, but anyway. Well, do yeah, the Basques yeah. have, have, have a rugby equivalent? Well, I, 
Well, we haven't got any teams that only play with Welsh players. That's one thing we've got. My local side, Newport County, is fan-owned, which is the same as Athletic. They have socios that own the club, and Newport County is a fan-owned club, which I'm quite proud of that. I like that. And then Cardiff City are obviously probably the biggest uh, Welsh club, but they wouldn't survive. Well, having they? said that, Swansea have been more successful uh, than Yes, recently. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. purely good on the, you know, historically maybe, but I don't think Swansea or Cardiff would survive only playing with Welsh players. I mean, in what within the championship now, but they. But is that well. really what makes the difference then? The fact that Bilbao is so strong about that part of their heritage. Well, what playing with only Basque players? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it that's what is it's fascinating. Is it, how are they? You know, a population of two and a half million or whatever it is. Mm. How are they doing it? Why do mm. they produce so many good players? Why do they, managers look look at the manager they produce at the moment? You've got Emery, Arteta, uh, um, Ariola at Bournemouth. You, you've had Howard Kendall. And Marcelo Bielsa. Yes, yeah. So they have, yeah, they have. I said they do have uh, foreign managers. Yeah, is that is that, is that where you? Yeah? No, no, is, no. Is, is, is Valverde just... Basque? Um, yes, and that's through his parents. He was formed in the Basque country because his parents are from further south, and they moved to the Basque country. So he's an example there of not born in the Basque country, but formed from a young age. In, in, and in why do you keep putting the fingers up for formed? For well, formed, because well, how do you de how do you define formed somewhere? It's not well, really I would it. define it, although I swear I've never seen my parents having it off, but I would define it from that point. You know, if you're saying, quote, unquote, <laughs> formed. Conceived. Yeah, conceived. <laughs> and that's another word for it. But I did know if, you know, they, they knew how to say the Vs uh, as opposed to Bs. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought I wouldn't go there with that yeah, one. Big, big fans of Transvision Bamp. <laughs> that, 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 they were playing in, in Donostia when I was there. You know? so, that was that was my entertainment. You know, oh, who's maybe. playing next week? Transvision Bamp. <laughs> anyway, that's a good one. Wait, anyway, I know as well, Chris. I mean, great book, and it's just come out. Hope it does really well. No, Lost no, the owners. Such a wonderful story to tell. Oh, there. yeah. And as the word that you've used a few times, unique. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, the unique story of Athletic Club Bilbao. And obviously, we're hearing that there's a lot of culture to go with that as well. And I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. That's probably what makes your book as unique as any other. But you are also a music writer. Yeah, we're seeing um, the guitars there in your, in your backdrop. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quite a few. I, I thought you were going to say musician then. I was going to say, no, you're way off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I do I do write a little bit about music and stuff as well. Yeah, in, in my journalism, they're my passion, you know. It's, uh, what, what, what's your stuff? What do you like? Oh, that's a tough, but a bit of everything, Tim. I, how would you define it? You know, my favourite bands. Well, I've got my, my picture behind me. I've got David Bowie there, my all-time hero. Manic Street Preachers being Welsh. They, you awesome. know, I like alternative music, but I like every, you know, I like a bit of everything. How about like Tom Jones, the old school Welsh? No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not a Tom Jones fan. No. How about Scritti Politi? Green Guard side is a genius he's, writer. He's Welsh. Yeah, he's yeah, Welsh. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's yeah, from yeah. Cardiff, born in Cardiff. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Know that. And actually, Scritti Politi were in the charts at the time. Indeed. Right? Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So what, what's 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 your view? And if anyone wants wants to uh, see what we're talking about, they just put in. Uh, on on uh, so your search engine, your favourite search engine, UK singles chart for this date, which is the fifth of May, nineteen eighty four. Looking at this chart, twenty ninth oh, of know, April to the fifth of May. Yeah, yeah. 29th I was of April. Uh, I was coming up, no, 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 nineteen uh, <laughs> at this point. So obviously, I remember it all vividly. And Dotton was was a was a music he, journalist when he wasn't getting involved in Stockholm lowlifes. So we we well, no we, by this point, I'd come back home to Blighty. Yeah, yeah. By this point, eighty four. Yeah, because you're running away from a murder rat. Exactly, you know exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that is a true story, Chris. Uh, I'm innocent, but it is a true story. <laughs> uh, but you, 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 you're you're two years old at the time, so you're obviously not kicking every musical ball. When you look at this chart, what strikes you? It couldn't be any more eighties if it tried. That's that's what I thought when I that's first looked it. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, yeah, I know, like that. Duran Duran number one. Yeah. The reflex, you've yeah, flex, 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 flex. Yeah, <laughs> and you've got Queen. You know, it's it's um to me that the, it's all the music my dad was playing when I was young. I think you know I, I'm not a huge Queen fan. I know that could be controversial. I no, appreciate I despise their musicians. Them. Despise their every breath. 
I love oh, him. Right. I'm I glad you him. said that. Do you like them <laughs> talking to you? Yeah, of course I love him. I love no, him. No, no, he doesn't. Yeah, this is yeah, just him trying I to carry favour with the, the no, army of Queensland. No, They're an absolute you know, disgrace. You know, you, know that, you know that word unique that you've used liberally? Well, when they came out, tell me anybody else that did the old Fandango the way that they did it, they were unique. Yeah, well, maybe there's the reason only they did it, though. I, I don't know. <laughs> if, 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 if you want a song where you use the studio for higher effect from that same time, yeah. I'm not in love, 10cc. That uses a studio for emotional effect. Bohemian Rhapsody has no emotional effect. It's just no, it wasn't with. supposed to. It wasn't supposed to. Well, what's the point of music with no emotional effect? Um, it, the emotional effect is different from emotion, though, isn't it? Emotional effect is effectacious, whereas emotion, I, I, I challenge you to find performers, musical performers, that um, put more emotion into their songs than Freddie Mercury. He puts a lot of emotion. He's also... Schlock. Um, a schlock merchant. Well... Sometimes music needs a little bit of a hand. Elvis was a little bit of a schlock merchant. Yeah, Las like, Vegas you know, Elvis, which is why I don't like it. No, even before Las Vegas. Let's go back to Heartbreak Hotel. I mean, they dressed him up. Heartbreak Hotel was written by a 50 to 60-year-old English teacher from Florida, a female. Um, and she wrote a song which was essentially a country song. And they said, no, no, I'll tell you what, we'll get my boy Elvis to sing this and he'll turn it into something else. And what he did was over-dramatize the heartbreak of the Heartbreak Hotel. So instead of it becoming a somewhat um, sad song, it becomes a kind of yeah, a throwaway song. And it's a big, a big song, actually, this for Queen, I Want to Break, break Free. Oh, it has it has all sorts of consequences. Um, it it damages them damages them seriously in the United States. Does it? Yeah, because of the video of Freddie Mercury dressed up as a woman. Oh, uh, oh, is it when he's the, the, when he's hoovering? The, is it that one? Yeah, yeah. Ah, the states yeah, yeah. that they weren't ready, they didn't like it, so it really damaged them. But where I, you know, where I live, South America. Wait they, it, till they get uh, sorry, culture club. At, as yeah, and as the era of dictatorships is is beginning to come to an end, I want to break free. Was bizarrely enough from an from a right wing band, which Queen were. It it it, it was it was taken up as a, as an anthem as a, as a pro liberty anthem. So it was it, it was a it was a song for them that that had consequences. But their year is going to come, which is the following year, because I, I'm looking at this chart. I don't know, Chris, if this is easy for, for your generation to, to get, but there was a really, really strong anti-rock vibe. Uh, and my generation, I was born in 65, we never heard Led Zeppelin. We never heard them, not least because they didn't want us to hear them because they wouldn't release singles. Uh, um, so th th they, you know, people often in Brazil ask me about Led Zeppelin and, and, and the progressive rock bands. And again, same thing. You, we, you never heard them if you were growing in what, up. In what way? Was it just not on the, just not on the radio or what? Well, they didn't, didn't, they didn't release singles and ev everything was, was, was singles, basically. singles driven. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it's but all the, about what, what is the single in, in, in the charts. But the point um, that Tim's really making is that we couldn't afford albums. Albums no, was like no. 10 weeks pocket money and, as but, opposed but to they, they didn't, they didn't want us. You know, for, you, you see this in the late 60s when the uh, the average age of record buyers starts to decline. Um, and uh, bands that are seen of having teeny bop followings lost their credibility. It's the thing that split out the small faces because, uh, you know, they have a big hit with, um, wouldn't it be nice to get on with my neighbours? You know, and they, they, they kind of cock me up and it it, it, it gives them a... It gives him a teeny bopper following that they didn't want. That's why Marriott left them. He, he, you know, he, he, he wanted to, to be more adult, which meant not doing the singles thing. And the industry at this time has, 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 has discovered with increases in amplification, the stadium. The stadium. And the stadium changes everything. It's why the Beatles split up, because they didn't want to play stadiums. They didn't have anywhere to get back to. Uh, there's a fascinating interview with Peter Jackson who went through all through those get back tapes. And he said, you know, they, they didn't break up because they couldn't get on with each other anymore. There were problems in the group, but that, that, that could have been, but the, their problem was they couldn't get back. There's nowhere to get back to. They can't play the one of the, the kind of venue that they want to play. 
So they end up going up to the roof on uh, on, on Apple Records because they won't play the stadiums. They've done it. They know it's bollocks. Yeah. But a few years later, the stadium becomes viable because amplification improves. And the Beatles are going through the stadium PA, you know. It's rubbish. Uh, so the amplification improves and it changes everything. The industry loves the stadium because you can sell more tickets. It's, it's, it's lucrative. And the stadium changes the type of song that's written. It changes the, 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 the type of, of clothes that the artists wear. And it changes the relationship between the artist and the audience. The artist becomes this remote rock god. And all of the stuff, I've always seen punk as like the last word in rock. And all of the post-punk stuff, rock wasn't allowed. Everyone hated it. And you see it strong in this charts. You, 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 you're just about to get... And this is the first week in the charts for everything but the girl. Uh, it's oh, wow. the first uh, Each and Every One, which is a gorgeous song. It's the first hit wow. record of Sade, Your Love Is King. There's a real anti-rock vibe, which has now kind of arrived at, at, at jazz. And so much of this gets clipped the following year with Live Aid. Because Live Aid, whatever we think about the humanitarian thing, and, and, and I'm sure everyone who's involved with it, their motives were, were sincere. But it's also the empire striking back. It's the industry um, getting those stadium rock acts back in pole position, which is why Queen steal the show, because they, are, they, they know how to do, do the stadium. So this chart, it, it just freezes it at a moment before the rock giants really come back and, 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 and take over. But I, I found those years, those post-punk years, I found them really, really creative. Going off in lots and lots of different directions. And one of them, memorably here, the specials, you know, Nelson Mandela. So many different musical and cultural directions. But the thing that everything had in common was trying to diminish the distance between the, the audience and a performer, which was exactly the opposite of, of the stadium vibe. So uh, for me, I think looking at this charts, especially once you get beyond the top 10, because the top 10 is a little bit schlocky. Once you get beyond the, the, beyond the top 10, it's full of, it, it, it's full of these, th these things that are, that are very, very anti-rock. And that was the vibe in 84. And subsequently, I think your generation rediscovered, uh, it was generations later than mine that rediscovered Led Zeppelin. Because we didn't listen to them. We had no opportunity to listen to them. We didn't, they didn't want them to, uh, us to listen to them. We didn't want to listen to them. But your generation's rediscovered, I think, a lot of this rock stuff. Yeah, I think so. And I think, um, you know, growing up, with my, my father's a huge music lover. So things like Led Zeppelin and stuff were a big thing for me. But yeah, rediscovering, I don't I think maybe music feels a bit like that in the moment. I, I, or maybe it's my age now. It doesn't feel like anybody's got a, you, you, you say, about, about post-punk arriving. Uh, there's, there doesn't seem to be any movement like that for me at the moment or anything that gets my dope maybe but oh, okay, gets my interest and maybe that's because i'm in my 40s now i don't know but it, it, it does seem like the music business is changing it well you know everything going on in the world particularly in britain at the moment and there doesn't seem to be any kickback against it i, I can't get my head around it where, yeah, where is this, where this is that is... punk where is the sex pistols where is the clash where is the modern day version i, I don't one, know one, one of our old producers plays in a band you know, and I rage on about him all the time. You should be writing songs about your landlord watching porn all day and getting rich. Yeah, yeah. Why and why isn't he? Yeah. Well, I think he is. He thinks. I think yeah, he has, he has yeah. tried to take my my dubious advice on board. But I, I agree with you hundred percent. Where where is that? You know, where is it's it, it, it's it's crying out for it, isn't it? Yeah, it's the. I mean, it sounds saying the perfect time sounds wrong, doesn't it? But it's a mess at the moment, and there, there needs to be that something for the for the for the youth. I don't I don't know. I can't think of the last band that came through where I thought, bloody hell, they're they're amazing. You know, the bands like the Clash, and I can't really think of a band. You know, probably probably being biased, the Manix in the early nineties came out, copied you know Clash wannabes basically, um, were polit politicized. I can't think of any other bands about it at the moment. I, I it's, it's, it's it blows my mind a little bit. Just on that note. <laughs> There is um, an anti-war sentiment um, that is highlighted by a couple of tracks in the charts. Because remember, this is only like a year after uh, the Falklands War. And... Um, you glad it's all over? Yeah, that's one of them. Um, really nice, actually. Well done. Mm. But the other one is... Um, gosh, what was it? I'm just trying to look in the charts very quickly now. Uh I can't see it even as I start doing it now. 
uh, but there are two tracks at least that illustrate the um the captain sensible is an obvious anti-war uh sentiment but then the other one oh it was lebanon wasn't it, it was lebanon by yeah human, um, league. Yeah, human league so there is something of a social conscience and context of these charts, but I think you nailed the description when you said this is a typically 80s uh, chart, Chris. What what exactly did you mean by that? Because for me, typically 80s has got to do with the sound of the times, not least the drum sound. You know, there's this really now looking back quite tinny drum sound that they seem to put across everything or underneath everything in the 80s that's what it means to me what what does that typically 80s mean to you well well i think what i meant by it it was um if i think of you know middle of the road 80s music i would come up with queen um lionel richie Phil Collins, Duran Duran is literally the top 10. So I saw this and I sort of said to my wife, oh, it's just, it's just the eighties. I don't know if I think of those bands. Yeah. They, they just, they personify the eighties for me, you know, the Thompson twins as well and, and, and things like that. So I wasn't thinking of the sound per se. Oh, well, I suppose I was thinking of the style of music, but the sort of bands, but then again, this is the charts, isn't it? Like, like Tim said, you're not the, the, the bands that I would like from the 80s are probably not going to be in the top 40, for example. But um, that's what I just thought. I just thought, you know, Nick Kershaw, these are all names that I, I associate with being really mm -hmm. young and just being on the television and, and on the radio. And and the, it's not even these artists, these pop artists' best tunes in the top 10, but that aside, Automatic by the Pointer Sisters, I thought was all right. And Hello by Lionel Richie. The songs are uh, all there's, right. There's, there's uh, some great r and B. I I mean, yeah, SOS Band, yeah, just be good to well, me. Uh, I mean, Jocelyn Brown, oh, yeah. someone else's oh, yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, what a yeah. fantastic record. Yeah, yeah. You, you know that I know, well, I haven't seen her in many years, but um, I, do, I was really I very close to Jocelyn Brown. Um that is what stands out for me here. There's Womack a... and Womack, Love Wars. Oh, it's brilliant. I mean, listening to it, it was a pleasure to listen to that again and um, just to remind yourself about it. You said Nelson Mandela, Special AKA. I think that is perhaps the most, well, it definitely is the most political of all the songs that we're seeing in the charts that maybe answers some of um, what you've been missing from contemporary music. Chris, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. if you think about it, it feels a little bit out of place now because Nelson Mandela has been released and he's passed on, etc. But actually, for what it did at the time, it did what no other song had done and it did the obvious because we were all crying out, those of us who went on anti-apartheid marches, the mantra was free Nelson Mandela. It wasn't, you know, yeah, yeah. free Walter Sisulu or anybody else that was also jailed by the apartheid regime and and they seem to capture it so beautifully and not in a kind of a, a a morbid way because that's a dance tune you know you play that i i had a party the night that nelson mandela was released i bought a house from the shoe bomber's mum and the shoe bomber was living me at, with me at this time that's a side issue but it's a big name drop i know but um Nelson Mandela came out that I was about to move to Los Angeles like two days after, so it was my leaving party. I don't think we played anything else all night long. And it was a proper old school house party. There's like 200 people in my house. I don't think we played another tune all right. No, I think we played Express Yourself by because the shoe bomber nicked that off me afterwards. I had it on a 12 inch and it was very rare to get at the time. But apart from that, I don't think we played much else than free Nelson Mandela because that's what everybody wanted to play it had a huge power we're looking at Frankie Goes to Hollywood there with Relax you know at this point at this point in 1984 it's been in the charts for 26 weeks it's Damn. absolutely phenomenal that was the first single by these Scousers who let's face it had a little bit of um, Freddie Mercury about them Tim yeah with a with a better producer, perhaps with more <laughs> whatever, whatever, with more, with, 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 with more rhythm. But yeah. I, this is a point because this is, <laughs> is, I think, it's a big year for music from the homosexual community going right. kind of going You're kind right. of mainstream. And what and do that, they do? Go on. You, you one that leaps out point. for me is uh, before we you take it back to Frankie. Uh, is it Evelyn Thomas? High energy. 
indeed that's what and then the triumvirate they've gone to black women to open up the gay disco scene for them you mentioned jocelyn brown uh high energy denise williams let's hear it for the boy it's raining men by the weather girls there's a whole quartet of these tunes that says look there's this huge... or even hazel hazel dean which is a kind of a local version you know yeah yeah but saying that this was hazel dean welsh He's, I have no he's, idea. He's, I did. I, he's not I going up to her, I don't think. No, okay. I, I did notice that Shaken Stevens is in the charts, though. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about. <laughs> I just didn't Stevens. want to mention him. No, I I want to mention him because in 1972, 73, I was a teddy boy. Maybe 1974 at this point. I was a teddy boy. Used to hang out at a youth club called the Grange in Southgate, and one day, guess who comes to perform there? Some bloke called Shaking Stevens with his band The Sunsets. He wears a gold lame suit like Elvis did in nineteen fifty-seven, so we know who exactly he's trying to copy. He's got the white dancing shoes, dances on the piano, and everything else. And I thought he's all right, Shaking Stevens and The Sunsets. Well, he, he was serious then, wasn't he? He, he, he just he Ooh. went very very pop. Yeah, exactly, because that's where the money was. He was. Did he go sick. more pop than Roland Rat's version of Love Me Tender? That is so bad. I didn't even <laughs> want to talk about it. Can I move on swiftly yeah. from that? Yeah. There's another one as well. There's the shocking version of That's the Way I Like It by Dead or Alive. It's even worse than I remember it, if that's even mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There are some shocking, shocking things. Uh, give a big shout out to Phil Fearing and Galaxy. Yes, I like them a lot. Oh my goodness, mate! He, he he should have been much bigger than he was, but he yeah, didn't. He and and uh, this is also the emergence. Talking about eighties, the emergence of not quite rap yet. It's what we used to call electro at this point, and uh, it's not quite hip hop either. It, it, they called it hip hop from the start, but this is a period called electro where you had. Uh, White Lines Don't Do It by Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel. And these two twins called uh, Break Machine. They're in there, aren't they? With Is mm. it Street Dance or something like that, they're calling it? And um, they were rubbish. They were absolute rubbish. Mm -hmm. But there is one or two, you know, coming up with a little bit of rap there, just coming up, Nucleus Jam on it, uh, Electro, I would call that, Um it's one or two things there out of the lecture. I can't find the next one that I wanted to talk about with regards to that after this. But um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Rock Steady Crew, Up Rock. And they were absolute shit in terms of music, but they were these Latino uh, break dancing crew who street danced by Break Machine in 67. So Up Rock by the Rock Steady Crews at 69. They should never have put out singles, but people wanted to make money out of them. They were like a break crew. And if I'm not mistaken is it apocryphal i thought that the that they had one woman one girl really they're all young um who's break dancing and was it her or one of the others that broke their neck doing a spin on their head which sort of uh, put the kibosh on kids mm -hmm. uh trying the same thing out on the streets as they used to in those days but yeah half decent charts though would you say chris yeah, oh, no. not bad. I just noticed the flying pickets as well. He, the mm. singer was Welsh, yeah. Brian oh, Hibbard, yeah. Although, have you heard the original of that? No. Yeah, no. you see, there are some things the flying pickets were good for, but when you're young and in love, wasn't it? Not a good one, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, I also, um, the Pesh Motor in there as well, you know. Indeed, indeed. Great band. Um, indeed. Well, I, I do like that. So I think overall, I say it's very 80s, but then again, Bob Marley, I know that was originally released in like 65, I think, but... Exactly. Amazing. Well, not this version, though. It's not the no. same version. So This is the uh, version with um, Curtis Mayfield's got a... Has he got a... That's right, a credit. Tag on it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, he's um, got a credit to it. Yeah, because he, he takes a whole Curtis Mayfield... Uh, Bob Marley takes a whole Curtis Mayfield verse and puts it in there. Um, so that's amazing. And your order. So it, uh, the further you go down the actual charts, the, uh, to me, some of the bands have become a lot more credible, yeah. maybe. I don't know, is that the wrong word? But, you know, more more interesting to me, perhaps. But it's not a bad chart overall, really. Well, which is the best track for you in the charts? Uh, um, I'm going to go with Bob Marley. I th I think you, you, I, I love, it's nice I, and I love safe. Bob Marley. It's nice and safe. And I grew up with him uh, listening to Bob Marley. You know, again, I say about my mum and dad influence and uh 
Yeah, I, you, can't, you, can't be, you can't beat Bob Marley. I'm going to go with It's Raining Men by the Weather Girls, only because I was in a gay club in uh, South London when I realised what they meant. Tim? I love everything but a girl, each and every one. Love it. Uh, it's it's a, it's a, a sound of summer afternoons. I love Jocelyn Brown. Uh, I love Womack and Womack, Love Wars. How do you make one. me choose one? Yeah, just yeah, one. Yeah. All right, no, right, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go because they, because she's a Newtown kid, uh, and if if Chris is going to go his Welsh thing, I'm going to go his Newtown thing. So I'm going to go with everything but a girl. <laughs> Why not? I need to change my shtick, don't I? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Your shtick is perfect, actually, and it's uh, all over your book as well. Los Leones is the book we've been talking about. We talk about one particular match: Athletic Bilbao versus Barcelona in the Copa del Rey, nineteen eighty-four. Yeah, it it was a match. Let's just leave it at that. But thank you for guiding us through the story of Basque football, though, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, thanks for having me on. It's, a, it's been an honour to come on. Genuinely, to be coming with uh, you two guys, it's, uh, it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, Christopher Evans is the author of Los Leones, the unique story of athletic club Bill Bauer. Uh, Tim, uh, I would keep that accent under lock and key, particularly the punchline about the donkey. <laughs> no comment.